I want to hear from home missions, but I want to tell you, I work in the sports world for a Scandinavian company. Their background were Norwegians. In 50 years, I became more Norwegian than Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I know that? Because my close friends that I grew up with, their name was Nordstrom. And they were a very successful department store from Seattle. And they told me one day, you know, she could never be president of Nordstrom. Like you are at Osborne and you. And I said, why is that? He said, yo, we don't hire in Norwegian to run the Swedish company. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we're so busy that we can't talk to each other from the heart. We rather lie to each other, and if you say it enough time, <clears throat> that lie becomes the truth. I know. I see a friend of mine out there. I attended Linfield College, a Baptist school in those days. My roommate was his younger brother. The school didn't know what to do with us. The First Baptist Church could not invite us. We looked like the enemy. Today, I served on the board. I attend the First Baptist Church of McMinnville, and I am welcome. And to give you a little bit more of the side of Baptist, I found that I decided as a child to be baptized. But there was no baptistry in the concentration camp. You know what that led me to? I was free to leave the camp to be baptized in Twin Falls First Baptist Church. But they never knew I was done baptized there. Years later on the pilgrimage, I spoke. The bridge was complete. We had made peace. And the same minister that came to be with us went to Japan, to Hiroshima, to build peace homes after the dropping of the atomic bomb, 1949. Did you know, at that time, a Chinese American, two black women were in that group in 1949. We never told the story. Those are good news. Why do we dwell on the negatives only? I had cancer. The doctor said, I'll give you up. Maybe 30 days. I'm glad the doctor was wrong. <coughs> I had it twice. He says, you're unfortunate. People your age don't get cancer twice. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, what, what, what are you talking about? You have two cases of cancer that are not related to each other. I'm still here. Mm -hmm. I told the doctor I won't sue him. <coughs> His bad diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> so I went on end early because you have heard the story, but I wanted to show you the other side of the story. My parents remained silent for the sake of their children. They gave up their language for me to speak <clears throat> English. I never had a mother or father's talk. I gave up chopsticks for night work and school. I gave up raw fish 
and sushi. Do you know today there are more people that don't look like me eating those food? <laughs> And one of my closest friends, Arthur Ash, his chef was a sushi chef. <laughs> it's too bad it takes us so long to tell our story. I live with you to tell your story so that I can listen to you and we can find common ground. There isn't a person I met that I talk about peace, justice, freedom, love, that we can't find that to be common ground. So I close, not as a child of 10. I never thought I would be here saying what I'm saying. The winds of God has given me a voice. And that voice is to speak for the people. And I've been invited by my Jewish community to go to Israel. I said, why me? You're a man of peace. You care about your people, but you care about all people. I said, come on. He says, do you know what Sugi are? I know you know shit. He does more than you ever thought. I said, I'm not privy enough to know Japan that way. They taught me. And the last question, when I was in Tokyo, when I was in Hiroshima, the hardest thing I had to do is to tell those people I dropped two atomic bombs on them. And they looked like my parents. But I was in the service. I was at Fort Benning, Georgia. I was an infantry officer. I had the clearance. Even at that time, <coughs> to drop with the atomic bomb. What am I saying? time to talk to each other. I don't want violence, killing, bombs to find peace. I want to find peace before that happens.
second will be that history repeats itself with painstaking precision. Third, misinterpretations of the doctrine of separation of church and state that restrict religious freedom and the rights of people of faith to be vocal activists in important matters of concern. And then fourth, the mischaracterization of evangelism as unrelated to social justice. Either one of these could be a seminar. <laughs> First, limited and uh, culturally bound interpretations of the Bible that can stifle our responsiveness to injustice. Given the selective persecution of Japanese American citizens 75 years ago, it occurs to me to highlight an ancient precedent to the persecution of ethnic minority communities and of migrants as found in scripture. The Bible is filled with stories about ethnic minorities and about migration, about the unjust sufferings that uh, so many migrants have been subjected to or were subjected to. Stories about God's displeasure with the social and economic oppression of migrants who have relocated to foreign lands. The Bible is filled with stories of social and economic oppression of everyday people migrating. Filled with stories about God's intervention in the lives of those who suffered forced labor, marginalization and oppression, and filled with stories about God's repeated call, nay more, God's mandates to people of faith to confront the oppressive powers. Moses, go, tell him, let my people go. Why me? Go, tell him, but I stutter. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Just go do what I say. Abraham's migration story is foremost. God did not only shield persons of faith as they migrated from one community to another, but God called and directed persons of faith to migrate. Abraham and Sarah win the Academy Award as the father and mother of faith. They placed immense confidence in the very first GPS system in history. <laughs> we call it the unseen voice. Only Abraham could hear that voice. The voice selected Abraham's destination for him, gave no advanced information concerning the route or the amount of travel time that would be needed. It simply instructed him to go to a land where God was, was sending him, and you will recognize it when you get there. So confident was Abraham in the unseen voice that he left his home in Mesopotamia, took his wife Sarai and their possessions with a few other relatives, left a substantial family estate behind, which he was slated to inherit as the oldest son had he remained in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. When we view Abraham's pilgrimage for what it was, whether through ancient or modern lenses, putting aside highly spiritualized interpretations, it was a story of migration, including all the socio-political contests and confrontations that surfaced in the course of moving from one nation to another. It would be accurate to state that migration is at the heart of the Hebrew faith in antiquity. Abraham, like all migrants, made mistakes as he traveled from place to place, crossing various national borders with no official documents of any kind. He and Sarah had no passports, no visas. They were undocumented aliens, immigrants, and strangers on foreign soil. All they had to support their legitimacy was Abraham claiming to hear a voice. Abraham could make such a bold claim because he believed the earth is the Lord's, including its fullness, the world, and all who dwell herein. Paul wrote that by faith, Abraham stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents. To whatever extent religious people side with ideas around building walls, 
or the anti-immigrant fervor of the day, Christians would be justified even today in affirming that the earth belongs to God and that God does not seek permission from human governments to inspire migration. We can lament the fact that as the theology of divine ownership of the earth has waned, we increasingly behave as though the earth is ours, that the land belongs to us, and that we get to call the shots about who should live where and travel where, uh, as it meets with the economic, political, and demographic preferences of the power elites. Nevertheless, God's migratory people have spread the gospel of God's reign throughout the world by way of migration. Faith movements are not limited to national borders or boundaries. Perhaps God has used migration as an instrument of human progress. Three of the dominant faiths across the globe, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all trace our genealogical and ideological roots to Abraham. God gave Abraham to the world, not only to show the entire world that God faithfully keeps promises, but also to show the power of migration, of welcome, <coughs> of hospitality to the stranger. Josh shared personal stories, Swedes, African Americans, Arthur Ashe, and Jews in Israel, Buddhists, that <coughs> migration made all that possible. What would happen, by the way, if, uh, to Sarah and Abraham today if they were alive and heard the voice of God sending them to America? <laughs> would we deny Abraham and Sarah access due to a religious test? Would we cite national security concerns because they lack the required documents? How many houses of worship we know about would deny Abraham access due to his religious, racial, ethnic, and cultural differences. Of course, we all know the story of Moses who confronted the Pharaoh artists in order to speak truth to power. Moses was not a left-wing radical, not inspired by Rauschenbusch, <laughs> not, not inspired by M.L. Cain, by Malcolm X, James Cone, Cornell West, or any social gospel icons of the 20th century. How could he be? Nevertheless, he was moved by God to lead a Hebrew Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the story of the oppression of the Hebrew people, who by this time were permanent residents in Egypt, not unlike Japanese Americans in California. This story was foundational in the scriptures with respect to the unjust treatment of minority groups. Moses' story is about raw, social and economic oppression of people due to their ethnic identity. Somehow that gets lost in translation today. Moses was called by God to declare a gospel of liberation of God's people to the political establishment. That was Moses' call. Moses aggressively negotiated their release from captivity and then physically led the exodus of Hebrew victims of forced labor and of human trafficking out of Egypt. In the New Testament, Jesus models an inclusive ministry whereby he consciously reached out to groups that were treated poorly and unfairly, including Samaritans who were despised. Why? Because of their religious, ethnic, and their cultural identity. He reached out to economically poor people whose needs were overlooked by the political establishment in Rome, overlooked by the religious establishment in Jerusalem. Women figured prominently in Jesus' ministry as persons who were ostracized socially, accused and punished by men for their actions, while the behaviors of the men were never pointed out. Women were left as widows to struggle with the economic and social implications of their status, abandoned by men, handed divorce papers without any continuing expectation of financial support, and so on. Jesus spoke up for them. He also protected children from marginalization and rebuked 
Even his own disciples, when they wanted to prevent children from approaching him to be prayed for. All these themes I am describing go well beyond the attention span of traditional piety. Goes well beyond Bible Belt spirituality. Beyond consumerist Christianity, which is obsessed with personal lifestyle choices and with the afterlife. Time after time, Jesus evidenced concern and intervention for persons that were poor, oppressed, marginalized, and living on the underside of the economy. And we know that in his inaugural sermon in the synagogue, captured in Luke 4, he read from Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, mm -hmm. to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord those home missionaries had to minister Amen. to the Japanese Americans Amen. in those camps. Amen. If they were going to be true to the gospel of Jesus. Yes. What is not highlighted often enough is that just three chapters later in Luke 7, when John was in prison and sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus did not hesitate in his reply. And there's any number of ways Jesus could have, could have verified or confirmed his identity. He could have said, well, I fasted and prayed 40 days. He could have talked about grace, the gospel of repentance. He could have talked about life after death. He could have talked about being baptized in the Jordan. There's all kinds of things Jesus could have said to confirm his identity. Here's what he points out. Go and tell John this. The things you have seen and heard, the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and word to the 21st century crowd, and blessed are those who don't get angry because I'm not spiritual enough, who are not offended by my ministry. An ancient passage in Isaiah provides a fuller insight into the imagery and meaning of salvation in God's scheme of things in Isaiah 12. It says, you will say in that day, and in that day you will say, I give you thanks, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. Surely, this says, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Biblical commentators point out that while it would be attractive to interpret the salvation being talked here about Isaiah purely in spiritual terms, there can be little doubt that the prophet had chiefly in mind the deliverance of the people from their enemies. And that was to be a consequence of God's forgiving grace. Later on, Isaiah praises the salvation of God in connection with exhorting people to leave the place of their captivity. Again, speaking socially, Isaiah speaks politically and economically, and to return to Jerusalem. Other commentators point out that these psalms remind us that it's difficult to separate a prophetic concern for justice, for righteousness, and God's activities and human events on the one hand and then ritual piety on the other. They go hand in hand. But we seem at times to be a one-handed church, mm -hmm. focusing only on piety. Mm -hmm. Those who say we should simply pray to Jesus about injustice and stop concerning ourselves with social, political, and economic injustices in the world are overlooking a great deal of the biblical story. There is an urgent need for the American church to evolve beyond pious missionary notions that salvation is purely confined to saving the human soul from sin and the guarantee of an afterlife in heaven as though God cares nothing about 